In topic three, we look at bonding, and we're going to start with ionic bonding. This will very much be a recap on uh, GCSE, but we're also going to add in some extra. Why are the noble gases so unreactive? Well, we can probably uh, now make an informed conclusion about that, rather than the fact that they just have full shells, which we looked at at GCSE. So when we look at low noble gases, we know that helium's got two electrons in the outer shell, and uh, neon's got eight, argon's got eight, and so on. But actually, argon's outer shell isn't full, because we know that argon could actually have 18 electrons in an outer shell. And now we know about shielding electrons from the last topic. So let's look at neon. Neon's got 10 protons and 10 electrons. Argon's got 18 protons and 18 electrons. Now let's look at the shielding electrons. Neon has got only two shielding electrons that are shielding those outermost electrons from the nucleus. Remember, it's only inner electrons that can shield. And argon has uh, got uh, eight electrons in the outermost shell, and so has got 10 shielding electrons. So both uh, neon and argon have an effective nuclear charge of eight. The effective nuclear charge is the number of protons minus the number of shielding electrons. So that's a huge nuclear attraction on those outermost electrons because you have the minimum number of shielding electrons. You can think about shielding electrons uh, in this way, if you like. Let's say you went to see a uh, famous superstar perform um, and you wanted to see this person, but you were at the back of the stadium. Now, those people in front of you are going to get in your way. You can't see the performance as much as you would like to. However, the person that you've gone with, who's stood by your side, is not shielding you from the performance at all. They're not in your way. You've still got a clear view. So they don't shield you. They don't get interfere with the performance. However, all those people in the front do. So let's consider now why would lithium react with fluorine to produce lithium fluoride through ionic bonding? Well, we've got our lithium atom there with uh, the effective nuclear charge attracting that outermost electron of one. And you've got fluorine uh, with the effective nuclear charge of seven. So that electron that is in uh, the lithium atom is actually going to be rather attracted to the effective nuclear charge that fluorine has of seven. So the nucleus is going to, the, the, the positive nucleus of uh, fluorine is going to attract lithium's electron away from the lithium atom and into fluorine's outermost shell. And that's why we have ionic bonding. And of course, we will end up with a lithium ion and a fluoride ion. Lithium ion is going to be positively charged and my fluoride ion is going to be uh, negatively charged uh, because he's gained lithium's electron. We now know why ionic substances form. What is the structure? So we've looked at the bonding. We have that attraction between the positively and negatively charged ion. But when we look at how the ions are going to arrange themselves, are they all going to be arranged randomly like that? Are we going to have a random mixture of positive and negative ions all mixed together when they become a solid? Well, of course, the answer is no. The positives uh, two positive ions are going to repel each other, two negatives will, and opposite charges will obviously attract. So they need to uh, combine themselves in a way to maximise those attractions. And so that's why we form crystalline substances, where the ions are all ordered in a lattice structure. And if we look at a cube, and uh, let's put some ions on our cube. So we're going to try and maximise the attractions between our positive and negative ions. And you can see, as we firstly build up the uh, cube, uh, we have a, a sodium ion on opposite corners and a chlorine ion on opposite corners. They maximise the distance that they can get away from each other whilst retaining how close they can get to their oppositely charged partner. And so we have a cubic structure for sodium chloride. And when let's look at the chloride ion. Uh, you can see that we've got actually six sodium ions surrounding that chloride ion to maximize those attractions between the oppositely charged ions. And that's why ionic substances have such high melting and boiling points, because not only are ionic bonds strong, there are lots of those to break when we have to melt something. We also know that many ionic substances are soluble in water. So why would that be? Well, water, and we'll come on to this a little bit later on, of course, is, uh, well, it's covalently uh, bonded, we know that, um, but it's got these slight charges on it. The oxygen is slightly negative and the two hydrogen atoms are slightly positive. And so because of that, they have that, that slight difference in charge. And so again, they've got those, they're going to attract those ions, the oppositely charged ions. So the, the little negative charge on the oxygen, and we use this little squirrely symbol delta. 
uh, to show it's a little negative charge, it's not a full negative charge, um, is going to be attracted to the Na plus ion and the hydrogen atoms, which have got a tiny little positive charge, are going to be attracted to the chloride ions. And because of that, they can uh, make their way in to the, to the uh, lattice and the little ions um, from the sodium chloride will start breaking away. And once they start breaking away, of course, the crystal will dissolve. So we're going to take that sodium chloride crystal, put it in some water, and uh, you'll see how the um, ions slowly start to move away from the lattice and the structure will begin to break down. And the ions will therefore become um, distributed throughout the whole solution. Another property that ionic substances uh, have is that when you dissolve them in water or you melt them, uh, they will conduct electricity. And the reason why they conduct electricity is uh, if we um, put uh, electrodes um, either side of our solution or either side of our molten substance, we see our positive ions are going to be attracted to our negative electrode and the negative ions are going to be attracted to the positive electrode. Now, we've illustrated that with sodium there. Um, being attracted to it, and it will be, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that when we're in solution uh, because we have um, other ions involved, which we come on to more in A2. Uh, but for the time being, you just need to know that really those, those positive ions are going to be attracted to negative electrode um, and so on. So that won't happen in a solid lattice because in a solid lattice, the ions are in fixed positions. They can't move. Uh, they, can't, they can't get to those different electrodes. However, when we melt them or dissolve it in water, they can. Now, Ionic substances are also brittle. Now, brittle is just the opposite of malleable. Rather than when we um, we try and bend them, um, they, they bend, malleable is they're going to bend. If we try and uh, bend a sodium chloride crystal, it's just going to snap. And uh, you can see, hopefully, why that's the case. If I try and push one layer against the other one, I'm going to push two negative ions against each other and two positive ions against each other. And they're not going to like that. And that's why the crystal will crack. 